Hey guys, and welcome back to a new episode of Android News, this time for June, in which I summarize those most relevant changes for Android developers from the previous month, so from May 2025. Starting off with Android Studio, which we got a new feature drop for, so a new version that brings new features to the currently stable version Meerkat. On the one hand, we got a new prompt library with Google's AI Gemini that is baked into Android Studio. So if you have some kind of favorite prompts or prompts that you just uh, ask on a consistent basis to Gemini, then you can now save them in a library inside of Android Studio. I'm personally not using Gemini and especially not inside of Android Studio. But if you do, then I think this is a pretty cool change. So you could store prompts like, hey, Gemini, do you see any issues in this code? Can you refactor this code? Can you write a test case for this code or so? And when we're already at test cases, here Gemini also brings a new feature and that is that you can now use Gemini as an AI assistant to generate test scenarios for you. So you maybe have a class, you have a function, you want to write test cases for that. Then Gemini can now give you all those test scenarios. So in the end, ideas of what would make sense to test for this function. You still have to implement the test cases yourself, but you get the function signatures and the, the, um, the actual ideas and um, what to test. Then this feature drop brings a preview for themed icons. So those icons, app icons that uh, actually change their color depending on the background color of the device. So these uh, dynamic color mechanisms. Um, we also have this for icons on Android. And if your app supports and has such a themed icon, then you can now preview this in Android Studio. And lastly, there were some improvements for the Compose Preview. So zooming is a little bit smoother now. You can now have actual collapsible preview groups so that you group certain multiple previews. You can then uh, collapse so they don't take that much space in the preview. Coming to the next big chapter, and that is one that I'm actually the most excited about because CMP, Compose Multi-Platform, is released, is bumped to version 1.8.0. And this might not sound special yet, but what comes is really special, and that is that it's finally stable for iOS. So you can finally share Compose UI between desktop, Android, and iOS all in stable mode. So that means that you can expect the same features from Compose Multi-Platform as you already know from normal Compose for all popular use cases. This means that we have type-safe navigation for Compose Multi-Platform, we have deep linking, resource management, a first-class accessibility support also on iOS. So for all these kinds of things like screen readers that read out your content descriptions, that is now fully working on iOS. Scrolling behavior also now feels really, really native on iOS. We have native iOS text selection. Uh, we have drag and drop. Uh, the system font size is actually applied. So if you're using SP units, then the actual user's font size preference will actually be used for that also on the iOS side. Then you have things like native iOS navigation gestures. So uh, gestures that really feel like uh, users know from uh, pure native iOS apps as well. And overall, the startup time on the iOS side is also now really comparable to native apps. And now that this is stable, if this is actually something you would like me to make a bigger course about, let me know that below. But we don't need to put a check to Compose Multi-Platform yet because there are even more cool announcements and changes coming. Because JetBrains has also been working on an improved version or an update of the existing uh, Kotlin Multi-Platform IDE plugin. And some things that I have really missed in Compose Multi-Platform are finally coming, that is on the one hand, an integrated IDE wizard to uh, create Compose multi-platform projects. As you maybe know, if you've uh, worked with that before, right now we have to go to the uh, KMP JetBrains website to just uh, download a zip file, open that in Android Studio and so on. Now that is not necessary anymore, at least from the next Android Studio version from now will, since you will be able to just create the project right away inside of Android Studio. What's also implemented there in this new plugin is finally a common main preview. So you will be able to preview your Compose multi-platform composables directly in the common main source that you don't have to work with any um, messy and hacky workarounds anymore that you maybe um, use the preview in the Android part of the code base. No, now that finally works inside of the common main code. And maybe you don't even need the preview anymore because Compose multi-platform nowadays also comes with a hot reload mechanism. So something we originally know from Flutter which is in the end the mechanism that you launch your app and then while it's launched, you can keep on developing your code and the moment you save your file, those changes about your UI will automatically be updated in the, um, in the running program in live. So with a maybe one second delay, 
which is faster than the preview. This is something that I've already made a video about just recently. So if you're curious about how you can make this work, then check that out. And the last thing that I think is really, really nice about this new plugin version is that it comes with cross language support. So that means you can now go inside of your Swift code, for example, command click into your functions that maybe come from Kotlin code, and then the Kotlin code will open and vice versa. Because before this code was really treated as two completely separate units, but now we can really explore it with our typical command click way of doing it because this plugin now comes with cross-language support. Okay, those were the most important changes about Compose Multiplatform, Kotlin Multiplatform, the plugin, but still staying in JetBrains for a moment, another news worth mentioning is that JetBrains is actually going into a strategic partnership with Spring Boot. So Spring Boot, if you're also following the channel a little bit, I'm actually making a few videos about, which is, in my opinion, the backend framework that you should choose if you want to build backends with Kotlin. Of course, there is also Ktour, but Spring Boot as a framework as a whole is just much more mature. I've worked with both and Spring Boot is just uh, much, much better to work with. But this strategic partnership between JetBrains and Spring Boot pretty much just means that we get first party support for our code for helpful utility functions inside of Spring Boot from JetBrains directly. So that means if you say you are a Kotlin developer, you like Kotlin as language and backend is actually something that you would like to explore a bit further and you would like to dive into, then now is a really, really good time to do so. An even better way to start with that is, of course, by exploring my videos about that. Um, I can recommend to start off with the um, Spring Boot Crash Course, which I have a three hour video about that really helps you get started using Spring Boot in Kotlin. All right, moving away from the JetBrains ecosystem a little bit towards the Google ecosystem. And here I have to share a new requirement that Google Play comes with. Um, I know these Android news episodes here are usually full of new Google Play uh, requirements, but this one is not too bad. And I see a reason in this requirement. So specifically, uh, Google is announcing uh, that there is a new page size um, requirement that your apps have to stick to. So specifically from November 1st in this year, 2025, your apps have to start supporting a page size of 16 kilobytes. So page sizes are something that is uh, related to memory, so to your app's RAM. If you think of your RAM as um, a book with thousands of pages, then obviously each page has a size and the larger the page is, the more we can fit into it, the more we can save there. And originally Android and um, Android devices got used to a page size of four kilobyte, which they've now changed to 16 kilobytes, which more reflects modern standards and in the end just improves um, performance a little bit. However, this only affects you and your app if your app has something to do with the NDK, so with native code. If you did not type any native code in your own app, then it can technically still be the case that you're using some kind of library that that, that does. Maybe you are using uh, some kind of rendering library or a video calling SDK or so. Um, these libraries are typically using some sort of native code. Then you will very likely have to update the versions of those libraries check the change logs of your library. And if they mention something about a memory page size limit or so, then um, that is probably the version that fixes it. If you're using your own native code in your app, then you need to recompile it with a more recent uh, tool chain. And in the end, check if you have any uh, memory management related code in that native code that may be incompatible with the 16 kilobyte page size. And the last big news that I think is really, really worth mentioning is that the new Navigation 3 library is now in alpha. So in case you didn't know about that, that's actually something that I teased here in Android News very, very early, even many months ago. But Google, in fact, released a new navigation library. So we now have navigation for uh, fragments originally, a navigation component it was called. Then we have navigation compose. And now we have navigation three, all from Google. And at first you might be like, okay, what the fuck? Why are they actually releasing that many navigation libraries? But I have tried out the new Navigation 3 library already, and I must say it solves a lot of problems that we had with Compose Navigation and Navigation Component. Because a big problem of Android Navigation was always that we did not own the backstack. It was always some kind of data structure deep down in the framework that is managed by the framework. So you could call it functions like navigate and pop backstack, but what this really does under the hood and how the real data structure of that back stack looks like, which in the end should really just be a stack, right? Um, that, that, that is something the framework has completely hidden from us. And that has changed with Navigation 3 because with Navigation 3, we 
100% on the back stack. And that means that you pretty much just have a simple field, a simple list in your code that hosts your entire back stack. So you literally have a list of nav destinations and that did not change at all um, compared to type safe compose navigation. So you have destinations, which are just serializable data classes or data objects. And you have a list of those and that list is your back stack. And if you want to navigate to a new destination, you simply push that new destination to that existing back stack. If you want to go back to the previous destination, you simply remove what's on top. But this also means that you could literally now, I don't know, shuffle your back stack or reverse it because you got the full control. And I can't count how often I had back stack related issues and the back stack wasn't behaving as I expected. So I'm really, really looking forward to this library, which is currently in alpha, um, but I've tried it out and it's already uh, quite promising. What this also means is that technically you could now take your back stack which is really just this um, compose state list, and you could store this in a view model. So you could perform your entire navigation inside of the view model. You would have full context about where the user currently is, where you can navigate, um, that you can, you can pop back, uh, back stack destinations from the view model. However, in that case, you are responsible for actually serializing that back stack and restoring it after process death. That's something the, the library does for you if you initialize the back stack in the UI but not if you keep it in the view model. But you know, technically what this means is you could now also say, I simply don't restore my back stack after process death because the framework now doesn't enforce this anymore. This would not be restored. And what this would mean is, okay, the user maybe minimizes your wrap and then the uh, while it's in the background, the Android system decides to kill it because it needs memory. But if the user then goes back to the app, well, then they won't get back to the previous destination they have been on, but they will simply start off with a typical cold start of your app and get wherever that would lead them. Yes, this is of course worse when it comes to usability. Ideally, we should restore it so the user gets to where they, uh, where they left at. But previously, process death also led to many issues because people did not handle all the other side effects that had. So the, the back stack was always automatically restored after process death, but your application state was not. That is something developers had to implement themselves. And I've reviewed so much code, people don't really do this. And this can then also lead to uh, quite bad states of your application if you get back to a screen, but the state is actually something that it actually shouldn't be because it, it completely got reset. So I'm not saying I recommend to not restore it now with this new approach, but I say it's still something, <laughs> an interesting thought at least, that this is not possible. And a new feature that this new navigation library brings that I am really looking forward to are called scenes. So a scene is in the end a composition of multiple screens that are shown together. So a most simple example would just be a two pane scene. So um, just having one screen on the left, one screen on the right, which could be shown, for example, for a list and a detail screen on tablet devices where you just have more space to show certain stuff. So this, these scenes in the end treat our screens more like uh, fragments in the original sense used to be meant for. But the cool thing is that each screen, so if we have a tablet device and we have a list screen on the left and the detail screen on the right, each of those two screens is still technically treated as its own screen, even if they are shown together in one scene. And that means we can still have, um, we can still bind individual view models to each of those screens because they uh, kind of have their own backstack entry. It's, it's not really called backstack entry anymore in this new library, but we can bind and couple view models to single screens and therefore, if we have multiple screens on a, on, a single, uh, on a single display, let's call it like that, then each screen still has its own individual view model. And you can just create your own scene. So if you want to have a scene that shows four screens in a grid, then you can now do this. And you can define the behavior, what happens if the user is on that grid scene, for example, navigates back. You can then decide which screen to navigate to in that case. So it's really flexible at the first glance. Something that I personally haven't found out about yet. Um, so I don't know if this does not exist yet or if, um, if I just missed something, but that is, um, I haven't found a way to group destinations. So to maybe share a view model between multiple destinations, which we originally could do with uh, nested navigation graphs. And something that I haven't played around with yet is how deep links integrate into this new navigation library. If this is something that's not supported yet or something um, that is already, I've taken a look at the default parameters of this new uh, nav display, it's called. So what was previously the nav host is now the nav display. There, I think, was not anything that hinted towards deep links. But as I said, it's still an alpha. So um, lots of things will probably change. But if you say, I want a video, then good news, um, I will record one. <laughs> and on that, I can say down below, you will find a link to more advanced Android premium courses. So if you say you're learning Android, then check out these courses because they really prepare you for the industry.
Thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.